so thanks so much for coming out. This, I, I've got to say, this is sort of the most futuristic room I've spoken in in a long time. This feels like some sort of uh, view of the future from the late 1970s, uh, which, is, it, which is about as futuristic as it gets, actually. The, the view of the future in the 1970s is way more futuristic than the current present is, uh, and a lot, a lot less depressing as well. Um, so thank you very much for coming along uh, to this talk. I've been talking a little bit about security in the context of microservices for a while, uh, and I need to caveat all of this by saying I am not a security expert. I am what I like to call a conscious incompetent. That is, I know I do not know much about this, and I've been trying to educate myself. Um, uh, and we'll get a bit more into that a, a bit later on. Um, I, uh, a while ago, I wrote a book called Building Microservices. Some of you may have read it. I am in the process of working on a second edition that will be out uh, towards the end of next year. I've got another book coming out in the middle of next year as well. but. Uh, more details on that later. And I now w uh, run my own company called Sam Newman and Associates. If you want to know more about the work we do, you can just find me on the internet. Um, I think it's, it's not a very high bar to find me on the internet. It's quite easy, I think. Uh, but we really are here to talk about security because I think we've been uh, ever more aware of the uh, importance of security and privacy of our information, of our processing, of our data. Um, partly because of revelations like uh, the Snowden revelations and the like, but also because it seems that every week we have another story about some sort of massive data breach. Um, it's, it's nice to live vicariously through other people's data breaches and think, well, you know, what's 143 million records if they're in the US? That's not going to happen to me. Uh, but of course, these things are all around us now, and we see them in the news, and people are starting to lose their jobs over these sorts of things, which tends to sharpen the mind somewhat regarding making systems a bit more safe and secure. Uh, we, of course, now even have our chips that have to have patches placed upon them as well. So it's a bit of a changing world. And, and, and you know, we've been going through this ongoing sort of debate with ourselves regarding software development, which is, you know, how much stuff do we actually need to encompass? I think most of us now sort of think about more whole lifecycle ownership of our software, owning sort of the design to the development, you know, ship, uh, testing the software, deploying that software, and thinking about these fast feedback loops, building quality in, doing more operations work inside the teams. Uh, but it still seems that in this sort of shift that's happened over the last 20 years, trying to move away from siloed roles, that security is still somehow left off to one side. It's sort of like, well, we'll build the systems, and then we'll bring in some experts, because we can't possibly know how this thing is done. So you have to bring in special experts that look differently and speak a different language to what we do, and they're going to just sprinkle the security in on top afterwards, and it'll all be fine, because uh, we couldn't possibly work out how to do that. It is where I feel we were 15 years ago, where we were with, with testing. You know, developers wouldn't test their own code because it works in our head. Uh, so why would we worry about it? Because I wrote it, so of course it's going to work. We'll have somebody else in a different team who will test our software. And we realize how silly that is, and we start doing more of that ourselves. But we don't necessarily all claim to be test specialists. There's still a role for test specialists. And I think when it comes to security, we are in the same space. Yes, security is a deep space with a lot of complexity involved with it. There's also an awful lot of low-hanging fruit that all developers can and should be able to handle themselves. And that's part of what I want to share with you today and do so in the context of microservice architectures, which can create some interesting challenges. It's just about I'm just trying to impart just enough security just enough security for you to get by. You know, when we think about our, our microservice architectures, um, security is an interesting thing. Um, with a monolithic system, you sort of have, you know, literally all of your processing is in one place. All of your data tends to be in one place. That means if it's, if it's hacked, you know, that one monolithic application is breached, everything is breached. Uh, if you have a lot of very, very, a, a very small amount of sensitive data stored in a database alongside lots of not very sensitive data, you sort of still have to treat that whole database as though it's all sensitive from a point of view of sort of auditing, compliance, sign-off. So you sort of have this, this sort of all your eggs in one basket type problem. The hope is with a microservice architecture that you get to isolate your concerns much more. You can isolate where your most sensitive processing is, where your most sensitive data is. That allows you to focus your time and energy. And hopefully, as well, for those of you operating in environments that have, that have things like regulatory sign-off or where you have heady auditing requirements, but this sort of delineation of processing and data storage might actually make your life easier in the point of view of getting things signed off.
because you can focus your time and energy and concerns in those places that need it. And for those parts of your application which maybe aren't handling uh, personally identifiable information, uh, which, aren't pro which isn't you know, sort of accessing sensitive systems, you can take a much more relaxed attitude towards it. And so on the face of it, we should be able to focus our time and energy in the right place with a microservice architecture. We should also be able to implement defense in depth. Um, and I, I have a theory that implementing or understanding the implications of things like GDPR may actually be a bit easier. And, and, and also from you know, protecting our applications, most of you probably work on a platform right now that gives you some ability to define networks using software. You can actually say have different you know, DMZs for different types of processing. Uh, this defense in depth and the way we protect our applications, this is really useful, having a lot of protections between us and the attacker. And you have a lot more perimeters that you can draw around your services with a microservice architecture. Now, the flip side, of course, is that with a microservice architecture, you also kind of drastically increase your surface area of attack. You've got a lot of information that used to flow within a process, which is now flowing between services. That is data that could be sniffed, observed, and potentially even manipulated. You also have more running processes that could be attacked. And you know, if you have a weak link, that could be disastrous for your, for your system as a whole. I sort of have this view that I think if you're savvy and smart around security issues, then the use of a microservice architecture may actually allow you to build significantly more resilient and uh, secure systems. On the other hand, if you have maybe a more naive approach towards security, a microservice architecture may well end up being a liability. We can explore that a little bit throughout the rest of this talk. I do, though, also want to share with you some basic stuff that applies to everybody, not just people building microservice architectures, but also uh, building any kind of software, really. And just a few quick basic things and that do have a sort of an interesting impact to the microservice content, uh, context. So the first off, start off with, uh, who here thinks they're good at assessing risks? If you can put your hands up if you think you're good at assessing risks. OK, a few people are right. So this, of course, is a loaded question, because you know I'm going to ask this question and explain how you're not very good at assessing risks. This is why only a few of you who are very brave souls said, yeah, I definitely know how to assess risks. I'm very, very good at this. Um, now, there's an excellent uh, report put out by Verizon. They put this out every year. It's called the Data Breach Investigations Report. The 2018 edition is now out, but I haven't updated this presentation yet for that. But both this version and the, the latest one are well worth a read. It's basically a very detailed analysis of data breaches that occur for Verizon's customers. Now, of course, this is skewed to North America, but they go into an awful lot of detail looking at the causes of breaches and the types and trends as well and how these things are changing over time. So they looked into uh, the causes and the mechanisms used by hackers in data breaches. Uh, and they found that the single most common technique used as part of hack attacks and as part of data breaches was something very, very simple, and that was uh, weak or stolen passwords. So passwords are by far and away the easiest way for attackers to gain access to your systems via a hack attempt. And passwords actually are very badly misunderstood by large parts of the industry. Uh, so there's a really good uh, piece of advice put out by the UK Cyber Security Center and NIST in the US. And these tend to be quite heavyweight, stodgy type uh, sort of government agencies, and their advice often is really targeted more at what the government does rather than the industry as a whole. But their most recent advice around passwords is actually really, really good, and it does actually fly in the face of some commonly understood wisdom. Uh, Troy Hunt's got a, a really nice write up of all of the advice, it's well worth a read, and is slightly more digestible than the source advice. Um, there's all kinds of great stuff in here a lot of which is quite surprising, especially when you start talking to uh, sort of CIOs and the like, where a lot of this is like, well, well what do you mean? That's not how things work. Um, some of this advice is really kind of quite straightforward, which is longer is stronger. Uh, having and allowing people to create longer passwords makes sense because password entropy is everything, and if you give people more space in which to create passwords, you're helping them improve the amount of entropy you store. Uh, it was interesting to note I had to recently sign up for an Office 365 account with Microsoft, don't ask, um, and I was limited to a 12-character password. <laughs> 
which made zero sense to me, because if you know anything about password storage, you know that that should be getting hashed into quite a long key anyway. So the idea that I should be restricted in how long my password is is kind of insane. I mean, 12 characters? I mean, really? Uh, that's absolutely potty. The other piece of advice they give is to eliminate complex character composition rules. And sometimes these two things go hand in hand. If you only allow people a short amount of space in which to type in a password, a short number of characters, in order to get entropy, you have to have them use lots of special characters. Whereas actually, if you allow people to put long passwords in, you don't necessarily need them to use a special character and everything else. What happens with this is that people end up being very confused about what makes a viable password, because the rules are just often unintelligible. You can't understand what's being asked of you or how on earth you're supposed to generate a password that fits these rules. So what do you do? You find one password that gets through those rules, and the next time they ask you to change it, you just increment a number. Uh, which obviously is a great way of opening yourself up to attacks. And a lot of these common password composition rules end up with very common answers being given by people who create the passwords, and those things end up in dictionary attacks that are used as part of brute forcing passwords. So get rid of character, complex character composition rules, allow people to specify larger and longer passwords, and tell them when they're complicated enough. Other things are embracing password managers. This shouldn't be news. But a lot of sites, including banks, I saw that Capital One, for example, does not allow you to paste a password into the password field for security, thereby basically meaning you cannot use a password manager. Uh, now, hands up if you use a password manager for your personal passwords. That's virtually everybody in this room. We are in Germany. Germany is a lot more savvy about these things. Now put your hands up if you use a password manager for passwords at your work. Uh, there are fewer people that have their hands up for that, which is a bit weird to me, right? That, that's a sort of, you, you're closer than I have seen with other audiences. In some places I've done this talk, less than half the people that have passwords for their personal stuff have them for their work stuff, which is insane to me, because often the impacts are, are greater. So password managers, embrace them, use them, make it easy for your staff to have access to them. Here's another piece of advice, do not mandate password changes. <laughs> Somebody either disagrees or agrees vehemently with me. I guess we're going to fight. I, he agrees. That's excellent. Um, why don't you want to? So what's the problem here? The reason people want you to change your password a lot is because they're worried that that password may have been breached or may gain access to it. And so they want you to change it a lot. And so you know what happens. You could log in in the morning, and up pops a window. Oh, God. Well, you have to change your password. It's the day of the month. Uh, OK, so please type in your old password. Oh, OK, fine. Now type in your new password. Oh, fine. And you see these bot boxes popping up so often, and you just inadvert you know, just without thinking about it, you put the password in. This is basically tra training a whole section of society for phishing attacks. Because you're used to a password, a dialog popping up, say, give me your current password. And you just do it without thinking because it's in your way. And actually, that's training people to accept this stuff. And it's training people to be ready and, and, and more open to phishing attacks as a result. Uh, instead, it is much more sensible to block previously breached passwords or alert your, your users when this happens and tell them maybe you should change your password because it may have been used in a breach. There are now great resources out there to help you find out if your users part might be reusing passwords that have been found in other breaches. Uh, you can, um, Troy Hunt's How I've Been Pwned uh, service, for example, now gets integrated into your own password manager. And so your password manager will say, you've used this password somewhere else that's been in a breach. You should change it. And even companies are now using this data to contact people saying, we think your password has been used in another breach of a site you used elsewhere. There's no sign of it being affected or used here, but you should probably change it now anyway. Now, that is a smart use of this information and a smart use of this data. There's other really good advice that comes from this piece by um, uh, Justin Smith over at Pivotal. I think he's at Pivotal. He talks about the three R's of enterprise security, rotate, repave, and repair. Um, and this is uh, his uh, way of defeating uh, what's uh, one of the most insidious types of malicious attacker, and that's something called the advanced persistent threat. 
Now, the advanced persistent threat is a, an attacker that will basically sit up inside your systems for a long period of time. It's typically a targeted attack where they will basically sit there for a long period of time gathering lots of information and then exfiltrating it which is a fancy way of saying FTPing it somewhere else. right? Uh, but basically, these are nasty types of attacks. Uh, the target uh, attack in the US uh, a couple of years ago was an advanced persistent threat where information, credit card uh, swipe information was stolen directly from electronic point of sale systems over a couple of week period. Another really recent example of, a, of an advanced persistent threat that arguably was being put to better use was the Dutch intelligence services, who managed to hack the Russian hackers behind the US Democratic hack. It's like a three-level deep hack. Um, but the Dutch intelligence services actually hacked, I think it was the, uh, uh, the group behind that Democratic hack of data. They were in their networks watching what they were doing. They'd even hacked into the CCTV cameras so that when the Russian hackers were going into their office, they took photographs of everybody walking into and out of the offices. Uh, and uh, the only reason this got shut down was because the US leaked the data. So, you know, anyway, it's nice to see people working closely together. But these sorts of uh, malicious parties, when they get inside your system, they can be quite, they can actually have access to a large volume of data over a long period of time, and it can often take a while for them to be detected. Justin's, Justin comes up with these three pieces of advice, which actually are quite useful at making these things very hard to pull off. Uh, so he talks about rotating and using short-lived credentials. These are typically system-oriented credentials, things like you know, uh, passwords for databases, um, you know, cloud-based API keys. Uh, we'll talk about how to handle that stuff in a minute. He also says, you know, patch your stuff. Just make sure you're patching things. We'll also come back to that, because that gets a bit tricky in a microservice environment, especially given how we build systems nowadays. And repave, which is just to burn stuff down on a frequent basis. Uh, one of the first times I had one of my, my systems uh, rootkitted, the attacker actually managed to patch commands like ls and ps so that you couldn't even use the listing command to see files installed by the rootkit because the, the rootkit had patched ls to hide all that information. And at that point, it was, I, I had to be withheld from taking the machine out and setting it literally on fire. Uh, instead, just wiping the whole thing out and starting again was the right way forward. And for those of you who are practicing this part of you know, burn it all down as part of your release cycles, you actually will often end up scrubbing out any uh, malicious parties. You know, if you're rebuilding everything from source code and deploying everything from source code on every single deployment, sort of adopting the Phoenix infrastructure type pattern, you'll often find yourself quite resilient uh, in the face of these sorts of attacks. Let's talk, though, uh, firstly about uh, short-lived credentials. Uh, can I ask if anyone here has heard of a company called Code Spaces? Hands up if you've heard of, no one's here heard of code spaces. There's a reason none of you have heard of code spaces. It's because they don't exist anymore. Uh, as the graphic shows, uh, they were a, a startup providing secure source code hosting, which is a little bit ironic given what happened. We're not entirely sure what caused this, but basically this system was running on top of AWS. And the root a, um, a, uh, credentials, the API keys, basically, the public and private API key pair for the root account somehow fell into the hands of a malicious party. It wasn't clear if this was just somebody who found it checked in to Git somewhere or if it was actually a, a, an ex-employee. But those credentials were used to wipe out the whole production system running on AWS, logged into the console. Bam, it's gone. Um, but that's OK, though, right? Because they've got backups. Yeah, they had backups. Backups held in the same. Amazon account. Uh, the concept of an off-site backup has different meaning on the cloud. Yes, it's all off-site, but if it's in the same AWS account, that's not good. But that's OK, because they had all the source code, didn't they? Yep. They had all the source code that was, that was in the same Amazon account. So the whole system, the whole company went in about 15 minutes, just because someone uh, lost use of those credentials. So it's now common practice for things like Azure and uh, AWS when you're issuing API keys to only issue those for very short periods of time. And typically, you know, using something like Active Directory Federation, you'll spit out an API key that might be valid for, say, 45 minutes or something like that at most. And then you might use that to initiate some automated process, but those credentials expire effectively after that period of time. And so even if someone got access to them, they wouldn't have been any use anyway.
Uh, there are actually tools out there that can help pick up things like this. I know that Microsoft and Amazon, um, and I assume Google as well, scan uh, publicly available repos looking for things that look like their API key format and will contact people if that's the case. There are also open source tools that I've made use of before. Git Rob is one that will look at Git repos looking for things that match API keys. Uh, this is in case people check this credentials in accidentally, which happens an awful lot. And so you can run this inside your corporate networks to make sure people aren't accidentally letting their credential files getting checked in. Um, and that's, this stuff is really useful. Now, of course, when we start thinking about short-lived credentials, things like API keys, database username and passwords, it's quite difficult to think of how we might do that with a monolithic system. But when we start thinking about that with a microservice system, it starts becoming a bit more daunting. We have, after all, many, many more running services, talking over lots of networks. There are loads of different credentials that we might need to deal with here. We have things like shared secrets, like API keys that we might be using to authenticate uh, between services. That's something we'll talk about a bit later. You know, each of our services may have a database. Our database needs some authorization, you know, some auth credentials to allow that service to you know, gain access to that database. So what happens if someone gets access to a text file with that information in it? They can now directly access our data. And that's sort of a concern. Uh, and you know, typically, a lot of these platforms end up leaving these secrets out in the open. Now, handling this is, uh, is something that typically gets passed over to systems called secret stores. Or there's some, lots of variations of these. These are dedicated systems which are designed to issue credentials uh, that can be where those credentials are stored in a, a secure manner. And the best ones also allow you to rotate uh, those credentials on a frequent basis. My favorite by far is a system called uh, Vault from HashiCorp, although most of the cloud vendors have something that gives you some basic version of this service. So on AWS, you've got things like KMS and the parameter store. Uh, Vault, though, as far as I'm concerned, is the, uh, I won't say the Cadillac of secret stores, because they're not very really great cars. Uh, they are the Mercedes-Benz of secret stores, or the Rolls-Royce of secret stores. Um, and it, it has some exceptionally useful capabilities. I could wax lyrical about Vault all day. But it does very, very cool things, like it can generate you know, uh, time-limited password credentials for different databases. So your service that wants to talk to its database, it goes to Vault saying, can you give me my credentials? And Vault will generate on-the-fly credentials just for your service, and will also expire those things and handle all that communication with the back-end databases on your behalf. Uh, it can also do the same thing for working with back-ends with different API gateway keys. And that can be useful both for your application and also end users actually using Vault to get information to those sorts of pieces of information. Uh, Vault also uh, works with a tool called Console Template, which will take a normal text file and will update that text file with these values as they change, which is really useful. So if you've got an application that reads its configuration from a text file, now what you can do is you can have your secret store automatically update that text file on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis when those credentials expire, which is a great way of having applications that you don't want to have to change to use Vault, taking advantage of how Vault rolls out those new credentials. So Vault is definitely worth uh, looking at, and it supports multiple different backends. So you don't have to run it on top of console. You can run Vault on top of etcd, which gives you a significantly better story around secret storage than you get, say, with the vanilla Kubernetes cluster. Um, other sources of data breaches. This is an earlier report from 2016 from Forbes BMC. And they found that in their research, 44% of all security breaches occur after vulnerabilities and solutions have been identified. In other words, the problems could have been avoided if the found vulnerabilities had been addressed sooner. So basically, we knew there was a problem. We didn't fix it. Oh, no, where's all my data gone? That's the kind of comedy of errors we're talking about here. Um, this comes back to the advice from Justin, patch your stuff. So a great recent example of this would be the Equifax data breach. 143 million Americans' data was stolen from Equifax. If you don't know who Equifax are, they are a credit checking agency, which means they have a lot of data to be able to do your credit checking and credit scoring, like everything that you have. And 143 Americans is a lot of Americans. Um, and this was all caused, basically, by an unpatched uh, parser vulnerability. Uh, now, what happened um, when the data came out is they claimed that this is all down to a vulnerability in, a, in a, a web application framework called Apache Struts. Lots of people came out, started guffawing. Oh, you're still using Struts. That's so old. 
actually wasn't the point. Struts is still very actively maintained and very actively patched. Um, that wasn't the point. The point was what the Equifax weren't necessarily updating those patches. When you start diving into these details, it's always quite fun. This, is, this was the CVE information. So you can go up to, to the CVE database and look up the information on this particular, uh, on all these different CVE vulnerabilities out there. And they give you a scale of how bad these things are. This particular vulnerability has a rating of 10. Uh, now, just to be very clear, this isn't out of 100. It's out of 10. And 10 isn't the good end of that scale. 10 is the bad end of that scale, right? So this is clearly a very, very bad vulnerability. Now, this vulnerability was reported in early May 2017 at the same time that the patches were already made available for the two main supported versions of struts. This is very common with serious exploits like this. What normally happens is a researcher will see this vulnerability, they'll alert the maintainers, and because of the severity of the situation, they'll make sure that the patches are available, but they'll also announce information about the vulnerability at the same time to get everyone to update those patches as quickly as possible. It's actually, in general, the right way of doing things. Um, now, in this situation, that was the right thing to do as well, but unfortunately, Equifax didn't apply this patch. So the information we know from the breach is that on uh, the breach at Equifax happened between mid-May and the end of July. They're not exactly sure when. Equifax found out this breach had occurred on July 29th. They then reported it on September the 7th. That is unacceptable. It's actually not something that you could do under the GDPR. You'd have to announce, uh, let people know within two days. The US does not actually have that legislation. Interestingly, a bunch of Equifax executives sold a bunch of stock between those two dates. I wonder why. Uh, that's currently being invested by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So a long period of time to let people know. So basically what we know is between the patch being available and then discovering uh, the breach, they basically had anywhere from a two to a four month window in which they could have applied that patch that would have stopped this attack stone dead. So a two to four month window. Now, hands up if you know that you patch all of your systems at least every two to four months. Can you put your hands up if that's the case? Oh, right, now let's, let's push a bit harder on that and find out if that's really true. You see, the problem is a lot of the systems we build now are systems building on systems, building on systems, building on systems. And it's like, do we really, really know what needs to be patched? Let's talk about a normal running infrastructure for a sort of a common topology for a services-based system nowadays. You've got your hardware, of course, and on top of your hardware, you have your operating system. On top of your operating system, you have your hypervisor, which vises hyperly. Then on top of your hypervisor, you have your virtual machine operating system. On top of your virtual machine operating system, you've probably got Docker. On top of Docker, you've got your container operating system, and then you've got your application. And every single layer needs patching. Even our chipsets now need to be patched. So this is all the things. If, you're, if this looks a little bit like where you work, how many of you know for a fact that, it, that you get patches applied at every single level in less than a two-month window? May put your hands up? We have now two hands up. Three. OK, so we've lost a few people. And often the problem is a lot of this other stuff is out of sight. It's other people that deal with this. So we don't actually have visibility. It's possible that this is being looked after, but we're not sure. Um, so, you know, what can we do about this? Well, we've got a few options. Uh, one of the first options is just to get someone else to do it. I mean, if you uh, go to a cloud vendor and have managed VMs, you're using EC2 instances on AWS, for example, that stuff is going to be handled for you by the underlying cloud vendor. They're at least going to handle this much of your stack. And if you think about something like Meltdown and Spectre, all of the main cloud vendors have applied those patches within uh, a week. And we could tell that because all of our machines got about 30% slower within a week. Um, now, of course, if you're using high, more highly abstracted cloud services, maybe you're using a managed Kubernetes platform from one of those providers, they will also be dealing with the underlying machine machines up to sort of the, sort of the Kubernetes library level, leaving you to this worry about your container operating system, which is under your control, and uh, your own application, which is at least focusing your time and energy. And these, again, are things that, are, while they're under your control, there are still some great tools out there that you can use to fix these things. Now, with FAS, of course, function as a service, there's even less for you to worry about. It is then just your application vulnerabilities. Now, of course, Equifax was caused by a third-party developer dependency. 
your operations team don't come to you and tell you to update to the latest version of the Jakarta parser library. That's something that is on all of you in this room. So that's something that you do need to sort out, because even if you are using a cloud-based FAST platform, that is under your control. Now, for container scanning, we've got open source stuff like Claire, although that starts to creak around the edges for lots of container images. There's also great software out there like Aquasec from Twist, which will give you both a sort of a build time and live understanding about uh, containers that you might have with vulnerabilities. This is especially interesting when you think about the microservice environment, where you might create a service that just works, and you haven't had to touch it for six months, so it's out there running on your cluster somewhere, and it hasn't been touched or changed for six months. That means it hasn't had any patches applied for six months. Uh, so that's kind of a, an interesting problem. Uh, but tools like um, Aqua are trying to bridge that gap to at least let you know that maybe these things need to be updated, even if the, soft, even if the code you wrote hasn't actually changed. For security dependencies for developers, for our third-party libraries, our open source libraries we might be using, I'm a big fan of uh, stuff like SNCC. So SNCC, I think, there's a few tools in this space. I think SNCC is the best example. What SNCC does is it looks at your, um, yeah, the dependencies that you have, like your Maven dependencies and things in your source code repos, and it will alert you when you're relying or depending on third-party libraries that have known vulnerabilities. And, it will, and you can even have SNCC fail your builds if you're depending on old versions of libraries that have vulnerabilities. It will even update you when these vulnerabilities are found. It will send you a nice, helpful email. Even better, it will sell you, send you a pull request saying, oh, it looks like you're using a version of Struts that has a really serious vulnerability in it. If you click OK, we will automatically update that dependency for you. Costs you about 20 bucks and probably would have saved Equifax quite a bit of money, I would imagine, if they'd been using something like this. These types of tools work, and they're very cheap, and they're very, very easy to integrate. And like SNCC especially supports a large variety of different languages. And there is very little reason not to just be using this as a default choice nowadays, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I've talked about the basic stuff here to an extent. And I'm talking about these are just things you just need to sort. But there are other kinds of risks that we might start worrying about. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get into some of the more complicated ones in a moment. But I would urge all of you that if, you are, if you're not sure where you're most vulnerable or where you should be spending your time when it comes to security, I'd urge all of you to do some kind of threat modeling exercise. Now, uh, there are lots of great talks out there about how this works. Uh, Microsoft have some really great information over their, their, their secure, digital, uh, their secure um, development lifecycle website. There's loads of information about uh, threat modeling techniques like Stride and Dread and attack trees and all those sorts of things. So it's well worth a read, and it's definitely a useful exercise, I think, for most teams to go through. When it comes to microservices, though, one of the things that people become most interested in is all of these little connections that run between our services. They start worrying about that network communication between things. Uh, so I've got uh, here's my latest version of Music Corp, my cutting edge company that sells CDs online. I've been using it since 2012. And clearly, business is not going very well for us. But we're going to diverge. We've, we've heard of something called streaming. And we think streaming might be the future. Uh, so we've downloaded the Scaling Agile at Spotify paper. And we assume that's how we're going to be successful and have a business that makes as much money as they do. Um, and we'll learn about the difference between revenue and profit at some point in the future. Anyway, here's our system, uh, and we're starting to get worried about how information gets intercepted. Uh, we've got some upstream people that are accessing our information. We also communicate with downstream parties that are sort of third parties. We start worrying, OK, well, there's all this information that's flowing out in the open. So what are we going to do about that? That's when we start talking about transport security. This is all the stuff that people love to fixate on. They start, this is where they start with this stuff. And I, I always say, are you patching stuff? Patch stuff first before you worry about these sorts of things. When we think about transport security, there are kind of four key concerns in the services environment. The first is, are malicious parties able to observe data that's being communicated between services? The second is, can that data be manipulated? Rather than paying Sam 100 pounds, you now are paying Sam 200 pounds. Sam is happy, you are not. Uh, you also need to restrict access to endpoints. Uh, can you stop people actually just accessing a REST-based endpoint via curl once they're on your network, for example? And can you stop people impersonating endpoints? This is a much, much rarer type of attack. You don't see it very often, if at all, outside of academic and sort of uh, theoretical circles. But it is a potential risk. 
one of the early theoretical uh, exploits against Kubernetes involved a malicious party spinning up their own Kubernetes node into an existing cluster and then taking the container workloads because the, the, you know, the actual Kubernetes uh, node it runs effectively in a privileged way so it can see all information on those containers. So the first answer normally for most people, especially if they're using synchronous communication and maybe HTTP-based synchronous communication, is just to adopt the idea of HTTPS everywhere. Because basically, this is easy nowadays. Um, so HTTP uh, and TLS, so HTTPS as we call it, gives you server guarantees if you're actually checking the certificates. I have worked in a few corporates where they go through the effort of implementing this, but they turn off uh, certificate validation because it's too painful, which makes, the, you know, makes the whole thing completely useless. Uh, but that gives you uh, security gu uh, server guarantees. It gives you certainty that the payloads being sent to your servers are not being manipulated. It doesn't do anything by itself around guaranteeing that the client is who they say they are, though. Uh, and uh, certificate management historically has been a bit painful, although I think that's a very weak argument nowadays. Uh, we have all kinds of software out there that can help us, all kinds of services out there that can help us. Of course, you probably all heard of Let's Encrypt. People went nuts for Let's Encrypt. They said, oh, it's free, which was never the point about Let's Encrypt, because it was never the $25 fee to Thwait that was putting you off implementing this stuff. It was the fact that it was painful and manual. So it's the automated part of these tools, which is key. If you're running on the public cloud platforms, all of them have very, very, very easy support for creating, reissuing, and installing certificates. You've got things like the AWS Certificate Manager, for example, that makes this stuff an absolute dream. So it's good. HTTPS and TLS is OK. It stops data being observed. It stops manipulation of data. It doesn't really do anything around restricting access to endpoints. Uh, but it does stop impersonation of endpoints. So already, with a pretty standard, well-used piece of technology, we're starting to get some safety within our, our system. And as a result, making it a default choice for communication within your perimeter and obviously outside of your perimeter is pretty much a no-brainer nowadays. Now, we can do better, and this is where Mutual TLS comes in. With Mutual TLS, we actually have a certificate running as well on the client, so the client when it talks to the server, the server is able to validate that, yes, this is a client that I should trust. Um, and so this is, gives you both the server and the client guarantees. Um, now, this is where, again, traditionally, certificate management of clients tends to be quite painful. But again, there is a vast array of software out there to make this much, much easier. We have things like, you know, on Azure, for example, the client side certificate management is really good. And you can actually handle sort of mutual TLS really easily using the API gateways. Uh, Amazon has similar kind of capabilities. If you're on the public cloud system, if that's where your microservices solution is deployed, there is very little reason for not using mutual TLS, as the experience of managing that is really quite easy out of the box. Certainly compared to what we used to have to do before, which is like in running our own PKI infrastructure. So mutual TLS is tick, 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 all the way down. That's great. Even if you're in a situation where you're having to manually manage client certificates, it can still be worthwhile, uh, especially when you're talking to external trusted parties, where you're talking to make, sending maybe uh, sensitive information over the public internet. In those types of situations, we'll often use some kind of you know, outbound bastion server where we have the client side certificates for talking to uh, external secured parties. So even if you have to do stuff manually, you're limiting the scope of where that manual work needs to be done in those areas where you're most concerned about information. But of course, if you can automate everything, just use mutual TLS everywhere. And that's now really being considered at least you know, table stakes for this stuff. Now, there are other types of protocols people use for communication. It's all very well me talking about HTTP-based or, or um, uh, TCP-based systems, but a lot of you might be using other kinds of communication protocols, asynchronous communication protocols, for example, for some kind of message broker. All these serious, sensible message brokers have similar solutions for this, uh, both Kafka and RabbitMQ, for example, which are two of the most popular message brokers for use in microservice architectures, have very good support for similar types of protection of data and often go further into role-based systems as well uh, to allow you to sort of slice and dice who can see watch topics inside a corporate environment. Now, so far, what we've been doing is talking really about transport-level authentication. Does computer A trust that computer B is allowed to talk to it? It's sort of server to server or computer to computer trust. We've sort of dealt with these service to service 
uh, authentication part of the problem. The bigger issue in a microservice environment is the fact that we have real people. We have human beings that need to access our system, and they start creating some interesting problems. So normally we have some kind of proxy-based system, maybe something that sits on the perimeter that handles the authentication of our users. We log on with a device, and using you know, basic auth or OAuth or something like this, the auth gateway ensures that when we make a request, we want to access some information that only authenticated uh, users are able to make requests to our downstream services. And so often we sort of terminate authentication concerns at the perimeter. This is a very, very common model, and for most people, it's quite sensible. The issue in, with a microservice environment is what we do when it comes to authorization. Authorization is really tricky because it's the question is, where do we authorize? So let me take you through a very simple example where um, uh, you know, I'm going to log in. So you know, when I log in normally, I say, I'm Bob. And the auth gateway says, are you really Bob? And then I, I'm forced to prove that I'm Bob. Uh, and Bob's always up to no good, so it's always worth checking what he's up to. And so yes, I really am Bob. Here's the information. And they go, yes, you are Bob. OK, great. You can now access the music web shop, and we'll serve up your profile page. Um, so let's run through what, that, what, what actually might happen in a microservice environment. So I'm logged in as Bob. I've got some token that represents me being logged in. I say, I want to go and access my profile. The call goes to the downstream music shop, which is the thing that renders my profile page. And the music web shop says, well, I know you're logged in, so that's fine. Uh, so I'm going to start rendering the page. Ah, but I need some additional information to render this page. The actual information about your account and who you are is actually stored in the user service. So I'm going to go and ask the user service for the information. So the music web shop goes to the user service and says, can I have Bob's details? And the, music, and the user service goes, well, you know, you're the music web shop, and I trust you. You've come to me with the right client certificate, and I'm sure you're, you're who you say you are. And you wouldn't possibly ask for information you shouldn't be asking for, would you? So here you are, and the data gets rendered back, and Bob gets to access the details. Now, as I mentioned, Bob is often up to no good. And so Bob looks at the URL and thinks, oh, hang on a minute. Look, my username's there in the URL. I wonder what happens if I go and change Bob. I'm going to delete Bob. And what happens if I ask for Alice's details? Alice won't mind. She's also always up to no good in these security scenarios. So let's find out what Alice is up to. So Bob takes out the word Bob and puts in the word Alice. And he goes to, to says, OK, I want to access Alice's user details. The auth gateway says, you're logged in. Great, OK, I'll let that call go through. You go to the music web shop. The music web shop says, you're asking for user data. I don't handle user data, but I know someone who does. So off the music web shop goes to the user service and says, can I have Alice's details? The user service says, well, you're the music web shop. I trust you. You wouldn't possibly ask me for anything you shouldn't ask me for, should you? You wouldn't do that to me. You're my buddy. You've got a certificate and everything. Uh, so it says, great, yes, no, it's fine. Here's the details about Alice. And the user service sends back Alice's details. And now suddenly, you're serving up a web page that Bob's requested with Alice's information in it. Um, that's not good, right? Now, this is actually an example of what's called uh, the confused deputy problem. The confused deputy problem is where you trick an intermediary party into asking for something it shouldn't ask for. Uh, and this is a bit of a problem. The issue, ultimately, is that we haven't authorized what Bob is allowed to do. And really, the problem is, where do we authorize? Now, we could, when Bob makes that request as Alice, authorize upstream to say, hang on, you shouldn't be asking for that. But fundamentally, what's going on is I'm asking for information that a downstream service is providing to me. So how would an upstream service know about the capabilities I'm asking of a downstream service and know what protections are placed around it? So in this situation, I would have to know that when I make a call or that kind of call, it's going to result in this information being served up by a downstream service, and I've got to provide some protections around that. And that's not too bad in this situation, but when you have more complex architectures, where you have more services calling services calling services, where does that happen? Making those decisions upstream seems a bit weird and alien to me. Instead, it would be much nicer if we can actually have the downstream service make the decision about what is allowed. But how do we do that? The problem is those downstream services lack the context of the original call, and so can't make those decisions. Ultimately, in our situation, it would have been good if the user service knew that the music web shop was asking on behalf of Alice or Bob. 
and then could use rules internally to say you're only allowed to ask for information of the user who's logged in. Now, one of the ways we can solve this, I mean, that's what we want, right? We want to, the music web shop to say, when I say you can have Alice's details, it should be the user service that says, no, you can't, because you're Bob. One of the ways people are solving this is using things like JWT tokens. This is a really good solution for that. With a JWT token, what you do is you create a token which has information. It's like a little JSON token. You create a hash of that JSON token, which proves that this token is actually valid. And then you can pass the hash and that JSON payload along with a request in all your downstream calls. Downstream services can use that hash to validate that this token is valid and then extract information from that JSON token that gives you the context of the user making the call. That then allows a downstream service to say, oh, hang on a minute. I know that Bob is the logged in user, but they're asking for Alice's details. And based on that, I'm going to reject that solution. So normally what you would do in this situation is you would exchange the sort of public internet version of your logged in token with an internal JWT token, just so you don't leak those JWT tokens out of your perimeter. So in this situation here, the user service has the context that Bob is the logged in user, uh, but that based on that, my internal logic says that you can only ask for information that's your information. And so at that point, the user service is able to say, no, don't do that. Uh, and that's the dream. Now, lots of people are using these uh, uh, JWT tokens as opposed to other more centralized authorization mechanism. It avoids the need for lots of round tripping. A lot of the, the centralized solutions I've seen require additional checks to be made. For example, the user service here would have to go, OK, I need to go and check if you're allowed to do this, and then go off somewhere else and make that check. A couple of the commercial solutions that I got pitched to me would involve additional round trips for every call that was made. And so if you had a service calling a service calling a service, there'd be like sort of you know, three network hops. They would double it up to being about six to nine network hops just to carry out authorization flows, which is clearly utterly insane from a latency point of view. So nice and efficient. You can do JWT token expiry. Uh, with really, really fine-grained permissioning systems, these JWT tokens can get a bit too big. So I worked with one company that was doing sort of music uh, rights management, and they reckon that some of their tokens to cover all use cases would have to have like 10,000 entries in them. And in that situation, what we did was said, no, no, let's use JWT tokens for the majority of our authorization flows, and in those really specific cases, then resort to some kind of centralized service for that stuff. Now, there's a lot more improvements being made in this area. I'm sure some of you are aware of things like service meshes. You know, service meshes are really interesting pieces of technology. They allow you to uh, sort of you can embed a service mesh onto contain mostly on container-based platforms. So both Linkerd version two and Istio work really well on top of Kubernetes. You've also got uh, Linkerd version one, which is a totally different tool to Linkerd version two, which is very confusing and another example of really questionable marketing. Uh, but they basically allow you to proxy all communication between services through effectively a, a set of middleware which is almost like giving to uh, synchronous calls what we've already got with asynchronous calls with message brokers. But they can now start handling things for you, like issuing of, and validation of JWT tokens, like implementation of uh, TLS. So even if you're not actually running on a public cloud provider, you may be able to drop something like Istio into your existing system and automatically get a lot of great stuff around the security side. It's still not going to eliminate the ability for your application to sometimes make decisions about things. But at least these things are starting to deal with some of the low-hanging fruit out there. And that's part of why uh, things like service meshes have become quite popular. I will say the service mesh world is quite a new world. Istio, for example, though it's been hyped for the last couple of years, has only really hit version one a few months ago. Um, and there's a lot of churn in this space, a lot more startups in this space. Um, and so it's, you know, if you don't, you know, by all means take a look at the service meshes, but don't be surprised if you pick one today, if you wish you'd picked a different one in six months from now. This is just the lovely world of Kubernetes platforms, you know. Uh, we used to joke, you know, and, and mock all those JavaScript kiddies for their ever-changing frameworks, and now we're uh, having exactly the same thing happen to us in the space of microservice deployments. Uh, but nonetheless, these can be really useful uh, uh, things in terms of implementing more uh, secure transport between your services, and so are definitely worth looking at, especially if you're operating in an environment where you've got a mix of technology stacks and you can't rely on shared uh, frameworks like uh, Spring Boot to handle all this sort of stuff for you.
Uh, so just in summary, uh, make sure you patch your stuff. Think a bit more sensibly about how you store your own passwords and how you encourage your users to use and manage their passwords. Uh, so some great advice there from NIST and the, US, the UK Cybersecurity Center. When you're thinking about storing secrets, secret stores are really useful. Definitely look at Vault uh, for things like generating short-lived credentials. It has a little bit of complexity to get up and running, but once you do and build it into your development workflow, it gives you a huge amount of just real good feeling out of the box. That is a great piece of tool. When it comes to transport security, mutual TLS is kind of a no-brainer nowadays. It doesn't eliminate all things, but at least it's a good stepping stone and stops malicious parties on your network interfering with what's going on. But you may actually need to consider what happens in terms of sort of downstream authorization decisions. Uh, and finally, do take a look at service meshes, although don't be surprised if there's a lot of churn in that field and they take a little bit of work to get running. But if you've got the time to invest, they could really, well, they could really deliver a lot of benefits for you. Uh, we are at uh, time, so I've got time for some questions in a moment. I do also just want to quickly say I've got a whole three-hour tutorial on microservice security that's available on uh, Safari. You can sign up for a free 30-day account and watch it. I don't get paid that way, so I hope you feel about, good about yourselves at that point. But anyway, um, you can find information over on my website about all of that stuff, uh, and I go into a lot more excruciating detail about secret stores and tokens. Um, so hopefully that will be useful to you. Uh, but thank you uh, very much for your time, and the slides for this are already available over on my website. So thank you. <laughs>